series is it going to be too prolonged um, it's a combination of a number of things uh, initially I wanted to look at um, like cults and world religions and we'd already done a portion of that uh, a number of years back um, you've seen it but I don't know if you were here for that one um, and yeah Joel was here for it we had uh, pastor had done a series on uh, the Essentials of Salvation, and basically what he did was he interviewed a Muslim imam, a Catholic priest, and then we were supposed to interview a Jewish rabbi. Uh, we weren't able to coordinate schedules. We can actually still do that. Um, it's just a matter of coordinating schedules between Pastor and Tony, myself, and then a rabbi uh, uh, locally that'd be willing to talk to us. That was, that was a difficult part as far as just finding somebody that uh, would be willing to talk to us. And it was... Uh, when we get to that point, when we watch the videos, uh, they're uh, roughly about an, almost an hour long, sometimes a little bit over. And um, what it is, is he goes through, and it's not intended to be a debate. Uh, it's simply him asking a number of questions on different subjects that pertain to salvation and then getting uh, answers from the horse's mouth, so to speak, with regard to, okay, what's your belief system on this? What's your belief system on that? And then, uh, and, and that the, the point of it was to pretty much to show, okay, here, um, this is what they believe, and then this is, you know, um, this is what the Bible teaches. With, and it was, it's all regarding salvation. Okay, so First Corinthians 15. Um, in leading up to that, we did a series on uh, the fundamentals of the of the faith, uh, combined with Baptist uh, distinctives, uh, and those are two separate things. And then that has its own separate history. So I figured, okay, if we're going to do that, we might as well just present that first and then just deal with uh, those subjects re regarding salvation. And then we'll lead into that. So, uh, okay, 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, uh, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, uh, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory that which I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And then he goes on to declare, it says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, uh, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Um, well, you'd have to, well, we'll just go to uh, verse 6. Um, that, because that's where the, the thought ends. And then he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, uh, but some are uh, fallen asleep. Okay, so Apostle Paul here is writing to the church of Corinth, and at this point in his letter to them, he starts addressing uh, an issue. We don't see it initially brought up, and it's going to be the fact that they're confused, or somebody has brought in teaching that um, there's no life after death. And then he's going to reiterate the fact that, hey, listen, man, you have received the same gospel which I have, you know, which I received. And he addresses that very pointedly in verses 3 and 4, which is that uh, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and then he rose again from the dead according uh, to the scriptures. And in particular with them, uh, he's going to also elaborate on some things with regard to uh, life after death, and that is the fact that there's going to be a point in time where we're going to have a transformed body. Uh, we're not to remain the same. In other words, not only yet do we have a moment <clears throat> that we have to look forward to, but also there's going to be a point in time when Christ is going to come and he's going to take us up to be with him. Now, he, he says that a little bit more uh, to the church at Thessalonica when he writes in First Thessalonians. Uh, but uh, he speaks of, hey, good morning, Mike. 
he speaks of a mystery uh, towards the end of the chapter that we're not all going to sleep. In other words, we're just not going to. There's going to be a point that when Christ returns, uh, if we're alive, then we're going to be transformed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, now we're not taking up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, but we're transformed. In other words, our body is uh, at that moment. Now the dead in Christ are taken. Uh, their their bodies transformed, but we'll we'll be transformed. Uh, God, God's presenting Himself is that, and then we'll uh, as the same manner in which He was taken up. Uh, if we were to go to uh, Acts chapter one um, and see how in the manner in which He was taken up, and that was that they all steadfastly looked upon Him as He rose up into heaven, and they went up into the clouds. Uh, so in that same manner is how Christ is going to return, and then also that we will ourselves be taken up. Uh, so he's writing to them to elaborate on that, but um, it goes without saying, okay, first foundationally is that, okay, we, there is life after death, okay, and that has uh, always been the case, okay, our soul doesn't just dissipate or we, you know, become part of the energy force of the universe, or those kinds of things, but rather there is a place where we will go to, where we will be conscious, where we'll be alive, where we'll be actively not only just thinking but feeling and sensing and those kinds of things uh, and we will have a body uh, down the road uh, we'll have a spirit body but our physical body will be transformed to be joined uh, with our soul at that time whenever Christ returns and so uh, he wrote to them to address that error that was that uh, that they were dealing with and uh, Okay, so how does this tie in with the, the fundamentals? Let me, uh, with regard to uh, fundamentals, the so fundamentals of testimony to the truth, or simply referred to as the fundamentals, is a set of 90 essays published between 1910 and 1915 by the Testimony Publishing Company of Chicago. It was initially published quarterly in 12 volumes and republished in 1917 by the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, or Biola. It's a four volume set. Okay, Baker books were printed all four volumes under two covers in 2003. Uh, okay, according to its forward, the publication was designed to be a new statement of the fundamentals of Christianity. However, its contents reflect a concern with certain theological innovations related to liberal Christianity, especially biblical higher criticism, and then it is uh, widely considered to be the foundation of modern Christian uh, fundamentalism. Uh, project was initially conceived. 1909 by California businessman Lyman Stewart, the founder of Union Oil, and a devout uh, Presbyterian and dispensationalist. And then he and his brother Mil Milton anonymously provided funds for composing, printing, distributing the publication. And then you had three editors, a, C, a gentleman by the name of A.C. Dixon, another one, L Ruben Meyer, and then uh, Ruben Architori, or Ari Tori was the, the third one, which he ended up being the president of Biola. Um, or Bible Institute of Los Angeles. He would have been also a contemporary with uh, D.L. Moody, uh, and he was formerly a, a lawyer as well. Now, the essays themselves represent a number of different things with regard to uh, Christianity, but in particular, they dealt with issues that pertain to salvation. Uh, these essays and the whole project is a, uh, I guess you say, not necessarily non-denominational, but they're cross-denominational. Uh, the individuals weren't Baptist. You, know, you might have some Baptist individuals that were in there, or at least Baptist-leaning individuals. Uh, but they were specifically written to address errors that were being uh, introduced into the church as well as into uh, Christianity overall by liberal and basically unsaved uh, Bible professors. Now that's kind of like weird to me why an unsaved person would want to really want to study the Bible. I mean, unless they're actually really seeking, but as far as to make it as a life purpose for them to educate themselves, take the time to train themselves as far as uh, Study the Bible. Hi, good morning. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. As to why they would want to study the Bible and then they would want to make a life out of just teaching it if they don't believe it. 
Um, but I guess, I mean, that's the same thing you have in a sense with uh, uh, atheists and uh, the evolutionary crowd. Um, kind of s similar as far as the mentality. So uh, now, as far as there's, of the 90 essays, they basically had multiple themes, multiple things that they addressed, but there was five in particular that, in, in which it summarized overall as to these are the five, you know, su a summary of, of the five basic teachings that you would have to believe in order for somebody to be born again. Okay, so you would have the inerrancy of the scriptures is one of them. Uh, so in other words, you know, God's word is without, you know, fault. In other words, God's word is literally God's word. Uh, so that is one thing. So you know, it, if you are going to believe the message of the salvation, and then you, you obviously have to believe the, you know, the book from which it, from where, where we get that message from. So God's word is going to be inerrant. Uh, the deity of Jesus Christ. Okay, so in other words. Uh, Jesus isn't just some good man, as some teach, or he's a, a great moral leader, teacher, and those things, but rather he's actually, he's literally God. Okay, so you would have to believe. Uh, and scriptures are actually very clear on, on a number of these points. Okay, so virgin birth of Christ. And again, that address, that kind of falls under um, the deity of Christ, I think. I don't know why they made it a separate point, um, but this is something also that's addressed as far as the virgin birth of Christ. Uh, then that, that really speaks to his deity. That's, that's what's significant about the fact of the virgin birth. Okay, so it's, it's, it's addressing his deity. Uh, the blood atonement. Okay, so blood was necessary, and then that, um, for one, fulfilling a prophecy, and then also, too, because the fact is there's no other way to, uh, you know, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. Uh, it's just clear just from, from Scripture with regard to that. And then the bodily resurrection of Christ. Um, in other words, if he didn't rise from the dead, uh, then, you know, our hope is in vain. Uh, and then we're all, you know, basically yet in our sins, as according to 1 Corinthians 15. Um, you, in some other listings that I've seen, they've added as well as just the existence of, of miracles. In other words, that, that just really adds, that you could throw that under either the inerrancy of Scripture or... Uh, it, well, that actually more falls under the inerrancy of Scripture than it does under the deity of Christ, because uh, bodily resurrection um, and virgin birth really kind of fall under deity. But uh, the 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 you know the, the existence of miracles, in other words, you can't you can't deny that you know there is supernatural happenings. There's supernatural uh, that transpires, and, and the reason why is because God's supernatural, and so they they. Um, the Bible professors that were liberal, uh, God deniers basically approach everything from a humanistic standpoint. And so you had an infiltration of a mindset that said, okay, if we can't explain it uh, from a natural cause, then there's no, you know, it, it, it's not really real, it doesn't really exist, it, it, there's no way for it to, to humanly happen. Okay, so that's, uh, Fundamentally, what they're doing is they're attacking just faith overall. You can't have, um, there's, there's, honestly, the fact is, you, <laughs> for much of what we would read in Scripture, um, it is supernatural. You can't, you know, this is this is beyond. If you were just take it from a human standpoint, you'd have to say, okay, wow, this is like mind blowing. This is not. Uh, this this doesn't just happen regularly. And the reason why is because God, God's supernatural. Okay, so of the subject, we'll look at them today. Uh, inerrancy of Scripture. Inerrancy of Scripture. And then, um, now when Pastor addressed the individuals, in, in, in essence, I mean, he had other things that he addressed them with regard to, but like, this is what he would he be addressing them. Okay, so what do you guys believe on Scripture? And then here would be the responses that were given. Uh, yeah, I think you're all here for that whenever we had seen the videos, right? Whenever Pastor had interviewed the, the imam and then the, the, the priest. Uh, we never got around to the rabbi because we, we weren't able to get coordinated with somebody locally that wanted to do an interview, even though we still could do that. Um, so we'll be analyzing that down 
not, not today, but we'll be done analyzing it a little bit down the road. Okay, Psalm 12, Psalm 12. Words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Okay, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Then we can go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Okay, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Um, we can actually go through pretty much the whole entire thing. <laughs> uh, as far as, because most of Psalm 118, actually all Psalm 118 is uh, regarding the, the word of God. Uh 137, go down, it, it'd be the same, Psalm 119, but 137. Okay, righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. Okay, thy testimonies uh, that thou have commanded are righteous and very faithful. Uh, Psalm 19, Psalm 19. And then we'll go to Proverbs uh, 30. Psalm 19. Starting at verse 7. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is pure. Uh, excuse me. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise is simple. The statute of the Lord's are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Okay, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. No more to be desired are they than gold, yet in much fine gold. Uh, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. And then moreover by them is thy servant born, and in keeping of them there is great uh, reward. And then Proverbs 30. Proverbs 30. Verse 5, okay, every word of God is pure. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Okay, every word of God is pure. He's a shield that put their trust in him. Um, before we jump into New Testament verses, what's a consistent theme? I know that seems kind of a silly question, but what's a consistent theme that you see that brought out with the verses that we just read? It's truth, but it's but it's pure. It's all it's also listed as being pure, uh, repeatedly. Okay, I got a question for you. Going back to the Corinthians passage, First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Yes. It says chapter verse two, but by which you also say, if you keep it in memory. What if somebody doesn't keep it in memory? What exactly does that mean to keep it in memory? Okay. Um. It literally just means to remember, to keep in remembrance. So I have. Remember what? The gospel or the scripture? 
in context, it's talking about the gospel of the message. Oh, okay. Now, it's not saying you lose it and forget about it. No. Well, that could be Yeah. All right. Salvation, the word itself, just means to like to be rescued, and it has multiple contexts. As it depends how it's used. The same thing with repentance. The same thing with a number of other different words okay. that you would see. He's speaking. Uh, Is it it's not. Okay. It's not written in chapter divisions when he wrote it. But just for the sake of the argument, we have 14 previous chapters that he's written to them that he's already guessed. I just wanted to comment on that verse. I think that uh, 1 Peter 1 5 is a good answer to that. We're kept by his power unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. Once we're saved, we're kept by his power. We can't lose our salvation. So he's saying if you keep it, if you keep it it's evidence that you're saved. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, so he, up to the up to up to this point, he's written just for the sake of the argument. I know it's not written with chapter divisions, but he's already addressed fourteen chapters to them. As mind you, when he starts off the letter, if we were to go to chapter one, he's addressing them as brethren. He repeatedly addresses them as brethren, so he knows they're brethren. Okay. He's addressing you know, they're they're born again. Now he already told them actually the verse previous that. They've received it, and they're presently standing in it. In other words, they've received the message, and they're standing. In other words, unless it's vain, unless they believe in vain. Yeah, but they, they, they've, they're to his knowledge, as far as he can tell, as far as he knows, they're they're born again. So he's addressing them from the standpoint, okay, okay. you're believers already. So yeah, he's saying if you remember everything that I've already talked about, if you remember what happened to you. You're going to remember this. It's, well, it's there. Here's the thing. It's actually a restating of Romans 6. He says, if you, you're standing in it, you've received it, and by which also you are saved. So in other words, there's a potential to be rescued from something if you keep in remembrance what you've already received and what you're presently standing in and what I am giving you. Look at the wording. I'm not trying to be funny about it. I'm serious. Yeah, would, would, You're saying Romans came before no. First Corinthians? First Corinthians fifteen. Okay. Moreover, I declare unto you the gospel. Now here's what he's already done about the gospel of his. He's preached it unto them. They've received it, and where you stand. Okay, so they're presently standing in the gospel. Now, the idea is basically you're born again, okay? You've also received it. So they wouldn't be standing in it if they hadn't received it yet. And he's already preached it unto them. Okay? And then it says, By which also ye are saved, if you keep in remembrance. Now mind you, he's already addressed them as being born again. So that means there's a potential for them to be rescued from something. If they keep in memory what they've already received. What they're presently standing in. Which is the gospel. Which he's going to re get ready to explain what that gospel is. Which is that Christ died was buried and then he rose again. Okay? So, what would that being rescued, what, what's the potential of being rescued down the road from? I'll just tell you, it's not from hell. In other words, they, if, if they were not standing in the gospel presently, if they hadn't received it, then yeah, it would be addressing the fact, but they already received it and they're already standing in it. So it's not talking about being rescued from going to hell. It's talking about being rescued from going into sin. It's Romans 6. In other words, if uh, it's the same. You have to reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, uh, alive unto Christ. And so the thing is, if you keep in remembrance, now what's the significance of that as far as that I keep in remembrance what I've already received, what I'm presently standing in? Okay, if Christ died for me, that means he paid for my sin. It's no longer my master. If he rose again from the dead, then I have new life. I'm able to be, you know, live free unto God, live the, the will of God. I can be, you know, spirit-filled. I can have victory over my sin. I'm no long, it's no longer my slave master. Uh, I have a new master. It's Christ. So if I keep that in remembrance, then I don't have to yield to sin. That's the idea there that he's going to address as far as... Okay. It's, in other words, it's a, it's a victory over sin passage. Uh, 
He's declaring something they've already received. Yeah, in other words, you're born again. You're, you know, you've received the gospel. You're presently standing, in other words, because that's the idea. You're kept, you're kept by his power. You know, you're sealed until the day of redemption. Now, here's how you're going to have victory. In other words, here's how you're rescued from going into sin. In other words, you don't have to sin. You can actually live a life of avoiding sin. Okay? The, you know, the prudent man foresees the evil. You can, you can avoid going into sin and, and be rescued from being destroyed by sin. Be, you know, by avoiding it altogether. In other words, avoid going into it. And here's how, because I keep in remembrance, oh, wait a minute, I don't have to sin. And here's why, because I'm free from it. I'm not, I'm not a slave to it. I can, uh, that, that's what he's addressing there as far as, uh, you don't have to, you know, you have to go and sin. Does it, does it make sense? Yeah, no, it does, yeah. I didn't mean to get you off the subject. Yeah, no, 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 that's fine. Um, okay, so Proverbs 30. Uh, and those other passages that we had read, basically the, the common theme is that God's word is pure, God's word is true. He's going to keep it, he's going to preserve it, uh, and so that all you know, succeeding generations would have availability to it. That's a promise not only did God inspire it, you know, give it uh, from, out of, you know, from out of his mouth coming, you know, but also the fact that um, it's, you know, it's preserved for us. So God, you know, God's word is true, God promises with regard to it. You know, he gives his word. And that, that was just a common thing that you see in the Old Testament, but not just in the New. In Second Peter chapter 1, a great summary. With regard to uh, the importance of the word of God. And not just, the great, not just the importance of it, but just the fact where it came from. Um... We started verse 15 in the second Peter chapter one. It's more of our endeavor that you may be able uh, that you may be able after my decease to uh, have these things always in remembrance, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Okay. Uh, this is him addressing the fact that he, James, and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration with Christ when Christ transfigured himself prior to, you know, passion, prior to his being put to death. So he, he reveals himself in his glory to them. And then you see Moses and Elijah come out, and then Peter is like, oh, you know, let us make tabernacles that we may stay here. And then, then, then you have the voice of God basically crying, you know, the, you know this is my beloved son, whom I will please hear ye him. And so he, he puts emphasis back on the fact that, hey, this is, you know, it, it's, it's, yeah, this is a glorious thing, but it's, it's Christ, the one that you're supposed to look to. And then, um, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount, okay, uh, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Okay, where until you do well that you may take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Um, now this is what he's going to say with regard to that more sure word. He says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Uh, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men spake. Uh, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Okay, so God's word was something that God revealed. He either openly declared it or he gave it through a medium, that being holy men. And they were moved along. And they were, they were born along. Uh, it was the Holy Ghost that moved these men to write what they wrote so that they pen down exactly what God had wanted. And so, uh, and by the way, it says if it's, it's a, of no private interpretation, so that means anybody can take the word of God if they're honestly seeking and searching, they're going to come to the same conclusion that God had intended for the original recipient of the word that he had given. Does it make sense? I know it's like in the word, so you can't just say, okay, oh, it means this to me, or it means that to another person, but rather this is what God means very clearly and plainly, and then openly declare, okay, this is this is just plain interpretation of it. 
uh, this is a plain meaning because this is what God had intended from when he had originally given it uh, through his medium to the original audience. Uh, so that, that's by extension not only, yeah, God had given it, but he also supernaturally preserved it so that we would have that available to us as well. And uh, he says of it that it's a more sure word of prophecy. Now, mind you, more sure than what? More sure than their personal first-hand eyewitness experience of actually seeing. Mind you, these people had company with God in flesh uh, from the time of baptism. Well, actually, from the time that they were called following the baptism of John. And then you have that up until... You know, he was put to death on the cross. Uh, then they fled, uh, with the exception of John, and then the women. And then you have, they come back, and then he presents himself those 40 days prior to being taken up to them, uh, being taken up from them uh, prior to Pentecost. Uh, and uh, mind you, following the resurrection. So they have that span of time where they've accompanied with, you know, God in flesh. Uh, he's revealed himself unto them. He's, he's given them supernatural ability for a number of different things. He's given them all great, uh, kind of great tasks. And here are these people that were first-hand company with God, you know, with Jesus, uh, God in flesh. And he says, you know, our experience is basically nothing compared to <laughs> the, 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 the veracity, the, the weight of the Word of God. Okay, so God's, God's Word has um, more weight and value than even what our testimony would be. Uh, and so, anybody would want to argue or deny with regard to the uh, Word of God, you know, you have multiple, uh, multiple uh, evidence with regard to the fact that God's Word is true, God's Word is pure, uh, God's Word is preserved. Uh, and God's Word originates, obviously, it's with Him. Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay. In Hebrews 11 and then Romans 1. Okay. Uh, Hebrews 11. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtain a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds uh, were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen uh, were not made of things which do appear. Uh, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, uh, he being dead yet speaketh. Uh, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had uh, translated him. Uh, for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. And in verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please God for he that cometh God must believe that he is, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay, pretty interesting. Now, I know this is very basic and very elementary, but the fact is, anybody that would want to come to God has to come on the basis of, now mind you, even following salvation, as far as how we're to walk, to come to God on the basis of faith. Okay, so in faith, as we know, is, is not by sight. Uh, definition here given, it says, it's the substance of things hoped for, and then it's the evidence of things not seen. Now, the word evidence is the same basic word idea of convincement or conviction so that's what conviction is is basically it's convincement so it's God's <laughs> spirit convincing you in your heart of okay this is fact and this is true uh, though you might have it's 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 that convincement of that of things not seen all right so it's not by sight so in other words I can't sit here <laughs> and explain to you you know, I'd like to be able to go ahead and bring out a ledger or a spreadsheet of some sort and, and be able to have the numbers add up for you. Uh, but in essence, you have to take God at his word, is, is what it comes down to. With regard to, if you're going to come to God, uh, 
that's that's the only way to be able to come to God. That's the way He's established for us to be able to operate. Be it for salvation, that's how you approach Him, and then also uh, following that as far as uh, believers walk in Christ, as far as how they grow. Uh, it's on that basis. That's how they come to God. That's how they. That's how anybody draws draws nigh to God. It's always going to be on the basis of faith, and it's not obviously by sight. And then Romans one. Start at verse 16. You can actually go a little bit before that, but we'll start at verse 16 just to get the context. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Therein, as far as in the gospel itself. Um, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Okay, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth. In unrighteousness or they hold back they suppress the truth literally uh, in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest where in them okay uh, for God had showed it unto them okay for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead okay now the word Trinity, you're not really going to find in Scripture, but the concept is there. And the word that's actually used to describe that is Godhead. Okay, we'll, 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 you'll see that um, multiple times in Scripture. But even even His eternal power and Godhead. And so it says here that so that uh, they are without excuse. In verse 21 and following, is going to describe as far as how a person ends up in a position where, uh, like how you run across many people today that are atheists, or agnostic or whatever term they want to use as far as like basically it's a God denier that says oh you know God's not really real uh, he doesn't really exist or whatever kind of argument that they want to put forth it says because that when they knew God uh, they glorified him not as God neither were thankful but became vain in their imagination okay, and their foolish heart was darkened okay professing themselves to be wise they became fools changed the glory of God uh, uh, changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things Okay, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart, uh, to the dishonor of their own bodies between themselves. Okay, who changed the truth of God into a lie, worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, uh, was blessed forever. Amen. And then for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. And uh, he would, in verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Uh, to do those things which are uh, not convenient. All right, so basically, in a sense, well, not in a sense, literally, what they did is they reject truth. Okay? If truth is the only thing that is going to rescue you or save you or have any kind of positive impact in your life, and you reject that, what else do you have to turn to? Nothing. You don't have anything else to turn to. You all have is lies and darkness. Okay, and whatever else comes up from your flesh or from you know devil's influence, uh, but the fact is you don't have anything else to turn to. So that's why you come up with all these crazy stuff, uh, weird theories and, and crazy teachings that you have out there in the world because they, they, they don't have anything else to turn to. They don't have any other alternative. You know, uh, they reject truth. They said, okay, no, I don't want that. The guys, okay, fine. You know, now mind you, it's not like. They are without hope. They are within the sense because they don't have Christ, but as far as, as long as they're alive, as long as they have breath in their body, they still have an opportunity to be able to receive Christ. They have an opportunity to be able to turn to Him. They still have an opportunity to be rescued from their sin, from going to hell, and they have an opportunity to be enlightened. Okay, so God's not through with them. Uh, and by the way, neither should we. Okay, we should pray for them. We should reach out to them. Um, but the fact is, that, uh, a lot of folks, a lot of folks that find themselves in this position 
are there by their own willful choice. They put themselves in this position um, because they said, okay, God, I don't want what you're offering. I don't want to know you, you know, and or however, however they choose to word it. The fact is they said no, you know, <clears throat> to God. And that's, that's why they're in this position. Okay, so with regard to fundamentals of the faith in heresy of scripture, this is along with the other things that we would address as far as the deity of Christ, blood atonement, virgin birth, you know, bodily resurrection, or the existence of miracles. The fact is, that comes about because they've established themselves in this mindset that said no. And then they, you know, you don't have anything else to turn to except the lies when you reject truth. All right, does anybody have any questions? Okay, next week we'll be looking at uh, deity of Christ. Combined in that is going to be virgin birth and body resurrection. Why, why is it significant as far as the, the virgin birth with regard to his deity? So we'll be looking at uh, primarily uh, deity of Christ co coupled with virgin birth and hopefully get resurrection in there. Uh, no questions? All right, so we're just going to